A few days ago, space enthusiasts around the world became more and more excited as China pushed their Long March 5B rocket carrying the massive Wangshan module of their new space station out to the launch pad. And yet, at the same time, space flight enthusiasts also recognized that this could potentially be another diplomatic incident for the world. The last time that China launched a module for their massive space station, the unused stage in orbit, it was not deorbited properly, did not have any sort of systems in place in order to conduct a controlled re-entry as most space agencies do, and it came back down, scattering debris mostly throughout the Indian Ocean, but a little bit of it managed to make it to land. That being the case, though, nobody was harmed in that particular incident, but here we go again. Once again, between four to 8,000 kilograms worth of space debris is likely to make it to the surface without burning up in the atmosphere, traveling at several hundred kilometers per hour, enough to cause substantial damage if it were to happen over a populated area. Thus far, nothing like that has really happened. There were a few buildings destroyed in the Ivory Coast back in 2020, the last time the Chinese created any sort Sort of substantial damage with one of these irresponsible re-entries, but this has the potential of being a lot worse. So when is this thing coming down, and where is it likely to come down? And just to make sure that this bulletin is not all about gloom and doom, we're also going to briefly talk about a new space habitat that was designed specifically to be used in the fairing of the SpaceX Starship. Hello YouTube, I'm the Angry Astronaut, and this is... Let's start off with the good news. The habitats that I want to talk about were created by Saga Space Architects, and it's not just a bunch of CGI images that we're talking about here. These are habitats that have been built, deployed, and tested under very difficult conditions, namely the very harsh environment of Greenland, which is not the same, obviously, as the Moon or Mars, but still very, very harsh. Now, this is a crowdfunding video that Saga put out some time ago to try to raise enough money to actually test their Lunark habitat out in Greenland, and they successfully raised sufficient money. And these two gentlemen that you're meeting right here are the guys who actually spent 60 days in Greenland being subjected to unbelievable environmental conditions. We're talking about hurricane force winds and temperatures down to negative 30 degrees Celsius. Yes. The Lunark is an ideal habitat for two astronauts to take along with them while they're exploring either the lunar surface or the Martian surface. As long as they have enough space and enough mass capability in their rover to carry this thing, they could quickly set it up in just about any conditions and survive inside it. Now, it only consumes 2.2 cubic meters. It is absolutely tiny and it expands to a space of 17.2 cubic meters. And as I mentioned before, these two guys spent 60 days living either inside this or simulating missions outside of the habitat through its airlock. The habitat has what's called a dynamic circadian light system, simply because on the moon there's either constant sunlight or constant darkness. So this is designed to create an artificial rhythm similar to what we experience on Earth. Very good for your psychology. On top of that, it is covered in solar panels. It has a separate sleeping pod for people to have at least a tiny bit of privacy. It comes with a 3D printer to manufacture simple tools also batteries, water tank and storage areas obviously, and an algae-based life support system. This is something that gets reused over and over again throughout their various designs. The idea is to utilize algae to recycle carbon dioxide back into oxygen. In addition to that, the water supply needed to circulate throughout the system for the algae provides protection from radiation, so it serves 
two purposes. It is a very interesting design, and I'm sure you're probably reading some of the subtitles that are included with this video as well. And apparently this was pretty convincing because, as I said, they raised enough money to test this thing in the field. But the second habitat, specifically designed for Starship, is called the Rosy, and it was designed in conjunction with the Institut auf dem Rosenberg, and it consists of a lot of interesting and innovative features. For example, it is 3D printed. That should come as a surprise to just about nobody these days. It's 3D printed panels, six of them that fit snugly around the entire structure. The shell is made out of a custom ABS polymer, which is glass fiber reinforced and UV stabilized to keep its color in the sunlight. Not sure why that's important, but nevertheless, it is a very solid structure that would work well in vacuum. It also has its own independent sleeping pods. It's designed for two astronauts, so the habitat has two sleeping cabins on the top floor. They have a soothing textile covering the walls and ceiling, making a relaxing cocoon where one can get some privacy see when needed. By the way, I'm reading this straight off their website. It also has personal storage, and the light is indirect, giving the illusion of natural daylight coming in from above. Now, the living quarters are on the middle floor, and here the crew can access two-touch dashboards to control all functions in the habitat. They can also monitor sensor data, and in this section, there's also a table which can be folded down to maximize space usage. The living quarters also has two desks, one for each crew member. The work surface is evenly lit, and there are two big storage cabinets overhead for personal storage. The desks fold, as I mentioned before, so the crew can use the space when not using each desk. There's also a window next to each desk so the crew members don't feel too encapsulated. Now the bottom level is the workshop, which consists of a large work table and several shelves for storage above, and under the work table is a charging station for Spot the robot dog from Boston Dynamics. The workshop also has a cabinet for experiments and storage, as well as a dashboard to control the habitat. And also on this level, you have an airlock. The habitat has a clean, futuristic airlock with sleek panels that make it easier to wipe down dirt before moving further into the habitat. The airlock also has an automatic hatch that can be opened from the dashboard to allow Spot the Robot Dog access to the habitat as well. I really like this design because they're incorporating so much stuff from SpaceX. And by the way, if you think this thing is far too small to be used with Starship, well, that's true. That's why you can put six of them inside Starship's fairing. So enough habitats for a dozen astronauts on the surface of the moon or Mars. Now, all of their designs are covered in solar panels, but in addition to that, they also have a separate power tower to provide all the necessary energy to the various habitats. This comes complete with its own solar panels and lithium batteries and heat exchanger, but also cryogenic tanks for fuel cells, perhaps hydrogen fuel cells. That would be the most logical substance to use on the moon. And on top of that, it's got another set of lithium batteries for backup and a section for fission power. So it has fuel cells plus solar energy plus a small nuclear power plant to provide the maximum amount of redundancy. But they don't stop here either. They also have recently come out with a Mars habitat, a far more ambitious setup than anything you've seen up to this point. And check it out, their Starship once again. This is a company that is embracing Elon Musk's vision in a big way. They're really jumping into the concept of colonizing Mars with both feet, and I think they should be applauded for that. Now, this habitat, as large as it is, only consumes eight cubic meters. So once again, you could put a hell of a lot of these inside the fairing of a starship, or you could release it in conjunction with their power towers or other types of habitats, and 
and create a very large Martian community with a single starship mission. All of the fabric and all of the materials involved in the construction of this habitat are extremely lightweight. They have this whole origami-like appearance to them that allows it to expand to a much, much larger volume and providing a great deal of living and working space for the Martian explorers. And as I said, only eight cubic meters for each one of these habitats. Think of the possibilities given the fact that Starship has over a thousand cubic meters worth of space. The equivalent volume of five international space stations in one Starship launch. Amazing possibilities. Once again, I'm sure you wouldn't actually do that, but that many of these habitats into one Starship launch, you probably want to combine it with other types of supplies and such. But by the way, these things also come complete with their own life support systems, again being generated by algae, providing not only oxygen and life support, but also protection from radiation, just like the previous models. So many potential uses for these types of habitats, an enormous amount of livable space being crammed into what used to be an impossibly small space, that is, the fairing of a rocket. What a breakthrough technologically. But as we get excited about these types of habitats, there's another habitat taking shape right over our heads that is very exciting in many ways, but is about to create yet another crisis for spaceflight around the world. After a successful flight, the Wengxian module, 17.9 meters in length, 4.2 meters in diameter, and weighing about 23 tons, the largest and heaviest spacecraft that China has ever built, has successfully docked with the rest of the station. This will comprise the second of a three-part station that will ultimately take shape in orbit. I'm very excited about this space station and what China is likely to do with it in the future, but unfortunately, given the size of the module, the rocket necessary to take it up burned up virtually all of its fuel in the process and had nothing else to do a controlled re-entry. As a matter of fact, it doesn't appear that the upper stage of the rocket was even designed with controlled re-entry in mind. Consequently, it's going to come back down again just like the previous ones did, and pieces of space debris as long long as 20 or 30 meters in length are likely to survive and crash into whatever happens to be underneath them at the time. Most probably it's going to be the ocean, but if it isn't, it could have very serious consequences. Where is it going to come down? Well, if you live anywhere in this region, and yes, that's a very, very large region, then you are theoretically in the damage path. That's the problem with uncontrolled controlled re-entries, the orbit gradually decays over time, and there are many factors that can impact the decay. The upper layers of the atmosphere can have varying amounts of impact on the orbital decay, also things like space weather and the amount of photons that are striking the rocket. That also can have an impact on how quickly this thing will descend towards the atmosphere. So we really can't say when it's going to re-enter with with any sort of accuracy right now, aside from saying that it's probably going to be within the next couple of weeks. Once the time gets closer, we'll have more information and I'll be able to provide it to you as it becomes available. And just to be 100% clear, even though other space agencies used to do things this way way back when, many decades ago, it's something that isn't practiced by much of anybody in this day and age. Age. It's simply irresponsible and dangerous to the population. Does it represent a massive danger? No, but at the same time, it represents an unnecessary danger. There are many ways that China could deorbit whatever they put up into low Earth orbit safely and without any hazard whatsoever to the population below. They simply choose not to. And that's one of the many reasons that I have a problem 
problem with this particular space agency. Please check the description for various ways to support my channel. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space!